Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks for attending this uh, webinar on um, issuing open science badges. We're very happy to have the editor-in-chief, the outgoing editor-in-chief of Psych Science, Steve Lindsay. Uh, he's a uh, professor at the uh, University of Victoria, professor of psychology, uh, and he's been the EIC there at, since 2015, um, shortly after the, the badging program was initiated. And he has a wealth of experience with getting the program up and running, and we're, again, very happy to have him here. So, um, Steve, would you uh, be willing to take it away? I'm, I'm happy to take oh. it away. And I, Let me interrupt you. I'm sorry. Let me just give a, um, one more housekeeping note before we get started. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, for folks attending, please feel free to use the Q&A, the question uh, submission that there should be an option that says Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, if it's a clarifying point, I'll rudely interrupt as I just did to so Steve, uh, you're sort of in the middle, but most of the questions will will leave till the end. So feel free to submit those over the course of the webinar. And a recording of this will be available and a blog post will be uh, available in about a week of this uh, transcript of the, the webinar. So back to you, Steve. Great, okay, thanks very much, David. And thanks for those of you who are logging in. I hope you'll find this, this useful. I'll just uh, flag that my, my uh, title slide here has my email address on it, slindsay at uvic.ca. And if, if you have questions that come to mind you know, tomorrow or next week or, or something, uh, I'm really keen on supporting these efforts. So uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to me. So I thought I'd begin just with a little bit of, uh, of background uh, on this. Uh, my predecessor uh, as editor-in-chief of Psych Science was Eric Ike, and he really got the ball rolling in an important way. He worked together with Alan Kraut, who was then, and for a long time, the executive director of the Association for Psychological Science, and with Bobby Spellman, who at that time was the editor of Perspectives on Psychological Science, uh, to uh, make changes that, that enhance the transparency of the works published in, in psychological science. Uh, so they contributed to the development of the transparency and openness promotion guidelines along you know, with leadership from people at the Center for Open Science. And in 2014, or right at the beginning, end of that year rather, they began awarding these uh, badges for data materials and pre-registration. Uh, and Eric Ike wrote a very nice editorial announcing the badges and some other changes, such as removing uh, methods and results sections from word count limits so that authors are free to, uh, you know, they have space to do free disclosure. Uh, anyway, he announced that in an editorial and I, I recommend it to your, your interest and it's free to the world. So, you know, does this work? Well, fortunately, some nice folks uh, uh, did a study where they looked at uh, psychic science, shown here in this graph in the, as the black line. Uh, in um, the measurement here is the percentage of articles that claim that data are available. And the dashed red line indicates when the badges were introduced. So uh, what you can see, if trust everybody can see my slides, uh, is that all the other journals stayed pretty flat, uh, but psych science shot up in a, in a huge way. But you might say, so what, that's, that's just articles saying that, saying that the data are available. And we basically ask people to make the data available, so maybe, they're, maybe all this changing is sort of what, what the article reports. But uh, the Kidwell, but all did an amazing effort to try to gauge that uh, by taking all of the articles that said the data were available, all of those from their sample that said the data were available. So we start up here in the upper left-hand corner of this graph. So that's 100% because they all said the data were available. Then these are various measures like, were the data actually available? <laughs> and you wrote to them and asked them for them. And were they in fact the correct data? And were they usable? Uh, and were they complete? And you can see that uh, for most of the journals, uh, a minority 
many of them came through with complete and use, useful data. Uh, and psych science did pretty darn well, not perfect, but, uh, but pretty darn well. And this is, this is from just right, you know, the first year of, of the badges. So it'd be really fun to see an updated version of this, of this, this study, but I'm pretty confident it would look good. Here is one uh, indicator that at least in terms of uh, apparent compliance, we're, we're, we're doing very well. So this graph shows the percentage of empirical papers, as you know, papers that report new data, published in psychological science uh, in various years from 2014 to 2019 that earned uh, the various badges. The blue line is the data badges, the orange line is materials badges, Edge and and uh, the gray line, the lowest line, is the pre-registration badge. So I'm I'm pretty darn uh, thrilled with this rather dramatic uh, increase in in badge earning. Uh, and it should be mentioned that the denominator here includes articles that that are not eligible for a badge. Uh, so in some cases, uh, the work is using proprietary data and they they can't make it available. Or in other cases it's already freely available. So you don't get a badge for using say Canada census data, it's already freely available to the world. Or in some cases, there are ethical or practical constraints on, on sharing data. Uh, and, and likewise with materials. So I don't know what, what the ceiling is, but it, it you know, might be something like 80% or something. Uh, so we're, we're getting reasonably close, I think, to to uh, ceiling level performance. In terms of meeting criteria for uh, the data and materials badges as, as they're uh, currently stated. Now it's not too surprising that pre-registration badges are, are flatter. It's I mean, for one thing to get a pre-registration badge for uh, work you submit in 2019, you probably had to do your pre-registration a long time ago. So it's going to be a, a lagging indicator and it's, you know, it's a harder ask. Uh, you can decide at the time of submission, oh, they want us to, to make our data available, well, well, we'll do that. But you can't decide at that point to, to pre-register. So it's not surprising that it's, it's a, a bit slower uptake. Uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm really delighted that more than a quarter of our empirical uh, articles published this year met criteria uh, to get the batch. And it's also worth noting that uh, most articles that receive a pre-registration badge also get the data and materials badges. So it's fairly unusual to be pre-registered but say I can't share my data or that kind of thing. So we call those tripper badger, triple badgers. Uh, and uh, so a lot, a lot of these have all three. Okay. Sort of funny to be lecturing out into the void. Hope everybody's okay. So the the next part of of the presentation is sort of the main featured content to talk a bit about our workflow. How do how do how do we we do this? And uh, don't worry too much about the fine print on the, these slides. It's it's just to I'm I'm showing you here screenshots that uh, David actually helped me get uh, from the uh, psych science submission portal. So if you were an author and had decided to submit a manuscript to psych science, as you went through, eventually you would be asked uh, uh, questions that have to do with the transparency of, of the work you're reporting. So for example, uh, we ask, uh, when inspired by Etienne Lebel's uh, article of a number of years ago, we asked for a research disclosure statement uh, that all dependent variables or measures that were analyzed for this target article's target question have been reported in the method sections, all levels of all independent variables, or all predictors or manipulations, whether successful or failed have been reported, and the total number of excluded observations and the reasons for making those exclusions, if anything, any, have been reported. So everybody sort of goes through those, and if they can't check them, they're supposed to explain them. Uh, we also ask people uh, to, I think maybe there's a missing slide here. We ask people to uh, explain why they believe their sample size was 
is appropriate. Um, and uh, we have, you know, fairly extensive instructions here that say things like precedent is typically a, a weak basis for, for answering. And if you're using an effect size estimate, you should say where you got that estimate uh, and so forth. And uh, it's, it's surprising and a little bit discouraging the, uh, the large proportion of authors who have difficulty answering uh, this question in a you know, sort of high quality way. I mean, to be fair, it's often a difficult question to, to uh, answer, but, but very, very frequently the responses that people submitting to psych science make when they're asked this question indicate to me that they don't really understand uh, uh, the issue. So people are still, despite these instructions, quite often saying that they did 20 per group because so-and-so did 20 per group or, uh, or, or because uh, Uri Simonson told them that 20 uh, per condition is, is a good number, or things like that that suggest that people are still not fully understanding uh, this, this issue. And again, I'm not saying there, there's not necessarily a right answer to this question, but what we're looking for here is some indication of understanding of the issues. People are also asked if they uh, stopped and analyzed their data partway through data collection and then decided based on the outcome whether or not to collect, continue uh, collecting data. I, I think I would probably, if I was restarting this or you know, if I wasn't leaving right away, I would probably drop this because they almost always say no. Um, and on the rare occasions when they say yes, they have sort of a, a plausible kind of explanation. Because what you know, what we're trying to do here is is uh, detect optional stopping, uh, but I don't think this item works very well uh, uh, for that. People are also asking about uh, uh, online supplemental online materials. So really keen on encouraging authors to provide uh, uh, material that sort of goes above and beyond the article and provides a richer description. So for example, videotapes of procedures and, and so forth. So we're, we asked them about that. Um, and then uh, there's a question about pre-registration that, that begins by saying, we understand that sometimes ethical or practical constraints limit authors' ability to pre-register their plans and or to make data or materials available. So we sort of acknowledge that, that it does, that's not going to work for everybody, but then we just ask, did you uh, pre-register the work? And, uh, uh, and if they say yes, we ask them to clarify, was that before you began data collection or after you began data collection, before, but before you looked at the uh, analysis? And we ask them to provide a URL for the, the pre-registration. Then there are a series of questions that, that uh, ask them uh, about uh, access to data, access to, to uh, materials. And uh, this includes questions about after publication, but also about how reviewers can access the, uh, uh, the materials and, and the data. So, you know, for example, down here it says, how can reviewers access any novel, unusual stimulus materials or measures used in the research uh, reported in your article? And uh, there's a similar question for, uh, for data. And you notice they've got options here, like all of them are uh, widely available or they're fully described in the, in the manuscript, i.e. people already have access to them, or such materials are provided in supplemental online materials, or they're at the following URL, or, not sure if this is going to show, uh, or reviewers can email a request to the editor who will relay the request to me, in which case I'll send the materials to the editor who will then send them to the reviewer. <laughs> that's a little bit convoluted, I know, but that's a way to uh, uh, maintain anonymity while uh, enabling the uh, reviewers to ask for the, ask for the data. Or finally, they can say, I won't be sharing the materials for the following reasons. Uh, so for example, they might be, it might be a copyrighted proprietary test that they're, they're not allowed to, 
to uh, share and they'll, they'll just say that. And, you know, typically they would also say, uh, you can buy the test at, at this source, uh, or I got these data from this source. I'm trying to pause and think here. I think there was something I was gonna add. I think it will come up here, right. So invitation to reviewers. So when I send a request to people to review a manuscript, it tells them what authors said in response to those questions about uh, data materials and pre-registration. So before reviewers accept a, a, an invitation, they know uh, like they can get the data this way or they can get the data that way or they can't get the data and likewise with, with materials and, and pre-registration. And when they submit their reviews then, you know, which obviously is usually several weeks later, reviewers are asked if the data were available and if they looked at them and if looking at them affected their, their judgments. And similarly, they're asked about the materials and the pre-registration. So we've been collecting information about reviewers' uh, uh, perceptions uh, for, for several years now. But one of the, one of the things that uh, is a bit troubling is that I don't have quantitative data on this, but I've noticed that quite often reviewers say that materials were not available or data were not available when in fact they were available. Uh, so, I think what happens is the invitation letter gives them that information, but the manuscript is, you know, some authors do a better job of highlighting uh, the information about the data or materials than, than, other, than other authors do. So if, if the author hasn't really uh, made it clear, then, then the reviewer may, may just miss it. So, and, and that seems a shame. So we need some better way of, of uh, standardizing and highlighting the way uh, the information about the availability of data materials and pre-registrations to reviewers at the time that they're they're actually doing the the review. So when an editor accepts a paper, the letter to the corresponding author includes instructions for uh, completing and attaching a. Uh, uh, open practices disclosure form. I think I have that form, yeah, this next couple of slides uh, show that, that form. So everybody is asked to uh, complete this form and uh, send it in. Uh, are you going to, uh, and then, you know, ask them, are you applying for the open data badge? And if so, uh, confirm that, that an independent researcher would be able to re reproduce all of the reported results uh, including a code book if one is needed, and confirm that you have registered the uploaded file so they are time stamped and can't be changed. And we have a similar thing for materials, same kinds of questions, and uh, similar things for uh, pre-registration. Uh, and the pre-registration thing also asks them to uh, make clear any departures or to aff affirm that any departures from the pre-registration were made clear in the uh, analyses. All right, are people doing okay? No big questions yet? So then when, when we finally publish things, we have a, 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 a open practices statement in the article, sort of after the end of the article, but before the reference section with all those other things like the author note and so forth, there's an open practices statement that displays uh, zero, one, two, or three badges, depending on what badges were awarded. But even if no badges were awarded, there will be an open practices uh, statement. So it, it might just say uh, the studies reported in this article were uh, not pre-registered and uh, neither the data nor the materials are available. And it's rare for that to happen, but we're allowing authors to be that, that uh, sort of limited in, in their, their response. Uh, but you know, here's, here's a, a more of what we're trying to encourage where the author says all the data are available and the materials are available at this 
uh, open science framework site and here's where the uh, pre-registration was and here's our open practices disclosure form and, and, and so forth. So every article has this open practices uh, statement in it. And I don't have a slide for this. Yes. Can I ask a clarifying question right at this point? Yes. Uh, is that disclosure statement created by the author um, based on the responses or is it created by, by, by you or production staff or somebody on, on your end based on, the, um, uh, based on the, the disclosure form that they filled out? It, it's, a, it's a bit of a mixed case. Uh, uh, some authors do it uh, uh, themselves and, and include it uh, and others don't in which case uh, our uh, production team, uh, the managing editor, uh, 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 puts it in. So this is, you know, it would be better if if it was again if that was sort of more standardized, I think. But but uh, at at this point, it's t it's still I think, I think a little bit too new, and uh, they don't they don't authors don't always know to do it or know how to do it. Thank you. What else have we got? So, as you know, if you're a, an editor for, for a journal that's doing this, at least the way we do it, if you're an editor for Psych Science, uh, when so you've accepted something, you send the authors a letter accepting it, and it has this open practices disclosure form, uh, which they're supposed to complete, and then they return to the, the submission portal. And, and submit their completed form uh, that way. And then once that form has been submitted, the action editor on the, the manuscript will get a ping saying the form has been uh, submitted. And uh, you know, as, as probably many of you know, there, for journals that have signed on to the transparency and openness promotion guidelines, there are several different levels. Uh, level zero just means that you say, we're gonna publicly say, we think all of this stuff is good. Uh, and level one means that you you're actually have policies in place and, and an effort to, uh, 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 I don't know, sort of reward uh, these, these practices. Uh, but we're, we are uh, relying essentially on, on author's self-report uh, uh, rather than, than doing a thorough vetting of claims, say, for data or, or materials. So in practice, the way this works is that the editor does uh, perform a review and makes a judgment, right? So when we get that open practices disclosure form uh, for an, an accepted article, we go and uh, look at the, the, the uh, websites and we uh, check to make sure that there appear to be data files and they appear to be have been registered and 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 they appear to have variable names that a person could possibly understand and and, and so forth so we're, we're doing that but we're not for example attempting to reproduce the analyses it would be better if we did but we just you know it's too big an ask likewise if they the authors claim a pre-registration, the editor is supposed to read through, and really you should have done this, you would hope they would have done this during the, the review process much earlier, read through that pre-registration and assess how complete and thorough it is. But to really do a point-by-point -point assessment in the, the case of a complicated study of you know every detail in the pre-registration and every detail in, in uh, you know, the manuscript is a, a quite time consuming and, and daunting uh, task. So I, we are, we're doing sort of a cursory assessment of does this look like a reasonable, a reasonably detailed uh, uh, pre-registration that maps on reasonably well uh, to what people reported they, they actually did. So it's sort of between nothing and everything. Uh, and in some cases, we do ask uh, authors for changes. Actually, I would say quite often, uh, uh, only a minority of the cases uh, do we just get the disclosure statement, look at it and say everything is fine. 
when people apply for badges, quite often there's some there's need for some additional uh, clarification, like the addition of a of a code book or clarification uh, and, and so forth. And indeed, sometimes people uh, uh, apply for badges, and after deliberation, we decide, "I'm sorry, you just don't don't meet the criteria for them." That's fairly rare, I would say, but it it, it does does happen. But so I'm. I hope that's clear. We're doing sort of a cursory analysis. We're trying to do uh, quality control to the extent that we can within our uh, uh, resources, but technically we're a, a level one TOPS guideline uh, operation, and that means we're not really uh, vetting the badges in, in a completely detailed way. And there, uh, you know, mostly I think this has been a tremendously successful uh, effort and I would you know I would put our your ability to get data from a psych science article up against that of any other any other journal in, in psychology but but there are there are problems and I think these are mostly addressable but but we, we do need some work one of them is that very often authors think they have registered files but they haven't uh, I think a lot of people think that what it means to register a file is that you upload it to the Open Science uh, Framework, and that that means that it's it's registered. Um, so somehow we have to work on on better educating people about what what that term uh, register means. And just just the last week, I've been uh, going back and forth with one of my associate editors, who's who's been on board for uh, a while. Uh, because he wasn't understanding this point himself. Uh, uh, so, if the data, uh, and another thing is, so I mean, how do we how do we handle that if if they say we registered our data, uh, but then you look and you see that it's they're not in fact registered? We just ask them, okay, please register them now. If, if when you look at it, you can look at it and you can see the dates that the files were last edited. And if it's consistent with the claim that, you know, in spirit, what, that the authors had meant to register them, they had put them there, they, uh, they haven't edited them since such and such a date. So it, it looks legit. Then we ask them to register them and accept them as, as meeting, meeting uh, the criterion. And, uh, you know, we'll do that even even with pre-registration. So quite often, less so now, partly I think because of the good work of David Meller and others on, on his team. But uh, so we're having fewer of these problems, but uh, uh, sometimes people will pre think they've pre-registered, but all they've done is created a, a Word document that has their plans in it, but they never, they never froze it or made a date stamped uh, immutable. Uh, version of it. But as long as it looks like uh, it functionally and sort of morally, it meets the spirit of the law of a pre-registration, we say, go ahead and, and uh, uh, register it now. And we'll treat it as having been pre-registered because we can see from the dates it, it plausibly was. Uh, another common problem is that although people have put a bunch of stuff on the uh, OSF or some other site, and perhaps have made a registered record of it. Uh, there's no wiki or general information that explains the relationship between that information and the uh, impress paper. Uh, you know, that, that's one of those things where we'll just ask people to to go back and, and please add such a thing because it, it just will make it easier for uh, people who end up at your OSF page. Uh, quite often there's no code book or index or guide and the uh, file names and or the variable names are, are, are hard to un understand. Uh, very often people are using, uh, you know, various kinds of uh, proprietary file types. So, you know, the ideal is that, that uh, the shared information is not doesn't require you to own software made by Microsoft or any anybody else, uh, but but 
often that's not the case. Um, another common problem we have is that we, we may get the data and we get the materials, but, but often we don't get the analysis scripts. And uh, sometimes, sometimes there's also sort of uncertainty about whether analysis scripts should be treated as materials or as, as data. Uh, and uh, there's an opportunity for discussion or uh, uh, future work along these lines. Uh, we could maybe talk about this. I think it might be better to have analysis scripts be a, its own separate badge uh, so that it, you, know, you could have up to four badges. And, and I'm sure David knows much more about this than, than I do. But in my experience, it's often as sort of a, an awkward thing about should it be a, how should it be categorized? I think it probably will be in the near future. I think there's sort of a, enough rationale for that distinction. Um, there, there's no voting uh, mechanism here. I apologize for the webinar attendees, but if you have an a, opinion on that, feel free to chime in uh, either to the chat or the Q&A. And, and, you know, the main reason that I'm, I'm keen on, on having an a, a analysis badge is that that uh, right now authors just don't, don't, I think they often don't even think about it. Uh, and if, if the editor fails to ask for it, then, then it's not there. And uh, I really think that, that it's uh, all, almost as important as the data to, to make, especially with you know, more complex analyses, uh, to make those, those scripts uh, uh, available. So, I would like to promote that. Um, when we get to the pre-registration uh, documents, often they're, they're not very good. Uh, and I, I believe they're getting better. And we started with very lax criteria where we were, we were giving people pre-registration badges if they had you know, even fairly vague and incomplete pre-registered plans. Uh, and we've been gradually cranking that up, at least that's I've, I've been making an effort to inspire my uh, editors to to uh, increase the the criteria uh, for that. Um, and quite often, when it, when you do look at them, you'll find unreported deviations from the the pre-registered research plan. So when it when it is sufficiently detailed, they don't authors are not always following it, and they're not always being transparent about. Uh, uh, deviations from it. And uh, my impression is that the frequency of all of these problems has declined over the, the last four years, but, but there's still lots of, of room for, for improvement. Uh, I thought maybe it'd be good to talk a little bit about uh, badge pushback, because uh, there certainly uh, is, is some. Uh, some people uh, think that uh, badges are puerile, uh, you know, harken back to Boy Scout good behavior badges or gold stars and, and, and so forth. And, you know, maybe, maybe they are uh, a little bit uh, that way, but, but boy, how do they ever seem to work? So again, I would point to those earlier graphs at the, the beginning of, of the webinar suggesting uh, to me that, that psych science is doing pretty well in terms of encouraging people to, uh, uh, provide their data, and you know, we don't know to what extent is that the badges versus other messaging uh, uh, efforts that we've made. But uh, I, I really think that a lot of people want those badges. Um, and uh, another concern some people have uh, expressed is that uh, the, the badging system may unfairly penalize articles that cannot qualify for badges. So your work might look worse because you're using a proprietary data set. And you know, that's kind of unfair. Your work is not worse because you're using a, a proprietary data set or worse because you're using a proprietary measures or, or, or something. Um, but but I, I really, I don't know whether there's, there's sort of a punishing effect uh, that, that happens uh, to uh, uh, articles that are published without badges. I don't, David might know about this. I'm not, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, empirical work on, on the issue of the effect of the badges on 
you know, readership, impact, uh, perceptions, and, and, and so forth. And, and I think it, I, I, hope, I hope that some people are, 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 are looking, looking at it. And, you know, maybe, I mean, I, mean, I do hope that, that the badges are just a transitory kind of thing and that, that in not too many years, we won't need badges anymore because it will just be normative that when, when it's uh, feasible and appropriate and uh, ethical, people make their data analysis scripts available and they make their materials available and they pre-register. Uh, and we won't have to be doing this, this kind of flagging uh, 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 exercise. But while, while, while that's not the case, I think we get more good than, than bad out of it. Uh, and finally, are badges sometimes awarded when they shouldn't have been? Well, absolutely, uh, for, for sure, uh, because as I uh, explained, at least at, at Psych Science, the, the level of scrutiny we're doing is, is quite lax. And, uh, uh, you know, clearly authors are, some authors at least are motivated to want to get these, these uh, badges. So uh, I really hope that uh, professional societies uh, the Association for Psychological Science, the Psychonomic Society, maybe even the APA, uh, will invest uh, money in, in, in providing support for authors who are applying for, for badges. So instead of asking editors to add this onto their, their workload, uh, I think there should be uh, an in-house uh, methods and stats expert who is analogous to a managing editor who does all the copy editing to make your uh, uh, manuscript have all the right semicolons and, and grammar and so forth, but instead is looking at things like the, the quality of your pre-registration and the clarity and usability of, of your data set. And I'm, I think it's useful to think of this not, as, not so much as a matter of vetting, as a matter of working in, in the same way that copy editors work with authors to try to make their work more clear and effective. Uh, so too, you could have an in-house methods and stats person who would uh, have the job of working with authors to make sure that uh, other scientists can quickly and easily access and understand their analyses, their data, and reproduce the analyses, and, and, and replicate their, their procedures, right? That's, that's what we want to do. A professional society should be uh, doing a lot to uh, increase the likelihood that other scientists can uh, really understand and evaluate and replicate uh, the, the works that they, they publish. Uh, is it a pain? Isn't it a pain for editors to administer badges? Yes. Uh, and, you know, some of my... Uh, editors uh, don't like to do it. They, uh, you know, they they were already editors when I added this, or we added this chore, and and uh, so uh, and so some of them do a better job than others, and, and so forth. And I would I would like to see this uh, again moved move to a sort of dedicated uh, professionals who have who are into doing it, who care about it, and who know how to to uh, to do it really well. And you know, in my fantasy, this would happen at some point in the review process um, for psych science articles. That would be um, when a submission was judged to be worthy of external review and went out for review and came back and was not immediately rejected. Very rare for a paper to be immediately accepted. So usually there's a a period there where the editor is going to ask for at least one more round of, of revision. And that's when I would like the paper to go to the stats methods expert. So that would maybe delay that letter for a little while while the stats methods expert uh, looked, looked at, at things. Okay. I wanted to, uh, on the, the last slide here, uh, uh, give a boost for a, uh, a new tool called the Transparency Checklist. This has uh, just come out in an article in uh, Nature Human Behavior, and uh, uh, it's a, 
a consensus-based way of uh, sort of summarizing a uh, pre-registration and reporting uh, departures from it. So there's a shiny app that uh, steps the uh, researcher through the uh, uh, you know, various kinds of questions. This is uh, Nature Human Behavior uh, made the paper open access so you can get to it uh, directly. Maybe I'll even do that just to show it off. So this is a little blurb that explains about what the transparency checklist is and how, how to, uh, you know, what it's to be used for. And then this is the beginning, the first, first frame of the checklist it, itself. And, uh, you, you know, you just complete it as an online form. And then at the end, it, it generates a, a report that you could uh, uh, submit along with an, an article kind of cool. Steve, I don't think they can see that screen, but, but I just shared a link oh. to the Shiny app uh, okay. to all the members. Okay, sorry. I guess I wasn't sharing that, was I? Yeah. Great. So you've, you've shared the Shiny app. Thank you. And that's, that's what I got. So now we have time for discussion. Questions? Great. Steve, thank you so much. I know I have a, a ton of questions and several have come in, so I want to sort of jump right into it. Um, it I want to talk about a couple of interrelated questions that, that came in um, about the uh, data badge. Um, if you go back one slide, I think it was your second point, do badges unfairly penalize articles that cannot qualify for badges? Two potential examples of that. Um, and Rachel shared a question in the chat flow also. Um, data sets that, you know, and you mentioned also, that rely on large publicly available data sets. Um, data sets that, of course, rely on you know, very sensitive information that there's no way to safely um, um, anonymize. And there was another right. question that came into the Q&A uh, about um, repositories that have that sort of uh, sort of vetting process mm -hmm. and the, the data sets aren't publicly available. There is a um, modification of the badge that, that some journals are considering adopting um, that that use the so-called protected access uh, data badge. So if it's you know, in a repository that's not publicly available, um, but it's you know, of course not an author's website, but it's somewhere where there's professional staff who are will vet these ethical requirements. Um, there is a modification of the open data badge that the badge committee approved to have that. It, it does, of course, require a, you know, a, an additional step, and it does, of course, most of those repositories you know, do need to charge fees in order to support that workflow. But that's something that some journals can adopt if they if, if they choose to use that criteria. Um, have you had any folks? ask about that or, or yes yeah that. yeah and in fact psych science has at least formally uh, adopted the uh, 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 protected access uh, data badge although I'm not offhand aware of any uh, uh, uses of it yet and I, I think it's it's fairly fairly uh, recent but I think that's a super exciting uh, uh, step forward in my own lab uh, uh, I've just recently started uh, uh, collecting some data where we we have videotapes of, of pairs of of uh, undergraduates who work together on a memory task, and you know, we always we always used to just we would audio record that and then we would basically score it for a very in very crude way um, because we were only interested in certain things, uh, but now I have uh, ethical permission to put that on the uh, uh, um, dataverse under protected access, uh, you know, provided the, the both members of the pair uh, consent to that. Uh, and and it's, it's protected access, so anybody in the world can see that there are such videos are there, but they can't see the videos unless they uh, uh, meet certain criteria that are, and it's modulated by the UVic dataverse librarian. So that, that's pretty cool. Cool. All right, I'll go down the list of these other questions too. Um, 
Jill, Jill Addison asked, how did the, um, how'd you get the research disclosure statement into Manuscript Central? We're trying to get simpler questions incorporated for our journal with a goal of top level one. Um, yeah. They said that we, they should collect information in a Word doc or Google form outside of the system. Um, so can you describe how, how that happened? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know uh, the details, the implementation, but I can, I can infer that it was not straightforward because the way it works is that, that the, uh, the disclosure form is an attachment <coughs> to the, the uh, uh, acceptance letter. And when they fill it out and send it in, then the editor gets an email with that as an attachment. So it's my belief that the uh, open practices disclosure statement is in fact not part, I could be wrong about this, but I don't think it's part of Manuscript Central. Uh, and so you, if you're the editor, you'll get a ping that says an uh, accepted manuscript for which you served as action letter has completed the uh, open practices disclosure statement, and it is attached. Please assess the uh, uh, attached application and then go to Manuscript Central and complete the form. And the form is just, you know, the push buttons. Did they apply for any badges? If so, you know, for each kind of badge, do they get it or not? And if so, why, you know, blah, blah. But the form itself is not not there, which but is good. There, there is that trend. Um the, the form or the set of questions inspired by Etienne Lebel uh, yes. that said, um, oh, you know, yeah. have you reported all of your measures, for example? Sure, yeah. so that's, that's in the submission guideline. Right. And uh, yeah, they've been pretty flexible about uh, letting me put uh, questions like that in. So I've, I've on a number of occasions, you know, working through the APS people who have the contacts with people at SAGE, uh, to make make the changes in the submission form. Um, here's a good question from an anonymous attendee. Given the overestimation of effect sizes in the previous literature, what do you see as the best ex explanation for that sample size question? Now, what's the best way to answer the, the, the sample size question? I think, I think the answer is, as with most psychology questions, it depends. Yeah. I don't think there is one uh, uh, best answer, uh, but uh, an appropriate answer, I mean, one, one way to, to answer it is uh, by specifying the smallest effect size of, of interest in the, in the context term in which you're working. Um, and, um, you know, you can point to some rationale for why if it's less than, than point Cones D of 0.25, I don't care, sort of thing. So that, that would be one way. But of course, if, if you take that route and it's between subjects design, <laughs> you're going to need an awful lot of, of, of subjects. So you might choose not to uh, uh, take that work. Yeah, so, there's yeah, a lot of implications there. Yeah, yeah. It's so, I mean, I do have sympathy with, with authors to a certain extent. Uh, that that it's it's hard to know exactly how to to answer that, but but there's some pretty clear wrong ways to answer it, and what's worrisome is how often those are what people use. So it's like I'm using this number because that's the number we always use, or because that was what was in the literature, or I did a little pilot study and I got a huge effect, so I'm going to use that sometimes out to the fifth decimal place. Uh, my effect size estimate from you know testing 18 people, I'm going to use that as uh, MG power three. Uh, Megan asks, is the uh, open practice disclosure template available? So that's I, an easy question. I can answer that. Uh, yeah. Yes, there's a, a template available um, and it's CC zero. So free to use or modify as you see um, fit. And that's, I, I believe, Steve, what you use is a modification of the link I just shared. Yeah. Um, or, but but very similar. Very similar, yeah. A few superficial differences, I think, but basically the same. Yeah. Uh, she also asks, would an open data badge be awarded if the data is in a repository, but to access, oh, yeah, that's kind of similarly, 
um, to, to another question, but you have to make a request. So that's that protected access. Yeah. And I shared a link to the, um, to right. the explanation for that criteria. Yeah, as, long as, as long as the guardian is not the researcher, basically, right. and, and, and you have reason to believe that it will be stable uh, for a long time. Let me mention something else that I meant to put in the slides, but, but, but forgot to make uh, explicit here. Um, and some people have criticized us for this, but we, we have uh, taken the position that uh, a paper with multiple experiments should get a, a badge if at least one of the experiments in that paper met criteria for, for the badge. So quite often, uh, papers with a pre-registration badge uh, might be uh, papers that have, say, three art, uh, experiments in them. The first two were not pre-registered. The third is, and the re that came about because the action editor said, well, this looks like an interesting line of work, but you haven't made the compase the, the case sufficiently compelling. If you run a pre-registered follow-up study along these lines, uh, uh, then I think you know, you'll have a good chance of, of the paper being accepted. So, so we've taken the position that those, those, uh, those papers should be badged. And my, part of my rationale for this is, well, con consider an article that has three experiments, only one of them was pre-registered should that uh, be considered weaker than an uh, article that has only one uh, study, namely, you know, the third one. Uh, so I, I, I'm taking it that way. On the other hand, I can, I can see the case for some way of designating, uh, you know, one out of three or something like that uh, as, as a, so that, that, uh, that, that readers don't get a mistaken impression that all of the studies in, a, in an article were pre-registered because that article has the pre-registration badge. Yeah, that can be tricky because the, the two situations you described initially are an ideal use of, of pre-registration, you know, two or three yeah. preliminary studies leading up to a, you know, very, hopefully a, a more conclusive, large right. confirmatory final study. But on the other hand, how do you kind of standardize a way that um, you don't just have a you know tiny little side project pre-registered and that gets the yeah. same kind of recognition as a, a more ideal practice? So perhaps that's um, it, yeah, it's just a tricky way to sort of make a blanket rule because you can't really have a very unambiguous criteria yeah. um, to to define the differences between those two. But it, it can again send mixed signals. Yeah. But a lot of the answers to these uh, sort of fall back to the, the importance of transparency and clarity, pointing out what was and what was not pre-registered. And that's true for an individual study and for a paper with a collection of several studies. Yeah. Um, Ian asks, what has been the impact on time it takes? You, you mentioned a little bit of this. Um, authors to submit a manuscript with the additional questions related to data availability and transparency. and um, a little bit, another question, uh, additional time for editors as well. Yeah, so I think, I think both of those are uh, uh, non-trivial. And uh, I know, you know, there's a new editor-in-chief coming in, Patricia Bauer will be uh, handling new submissions as of the first of the year. And I know that she's working with APS staff on changing the, the uh, submission portal uh, and and that you know part of her aim in, in doing that is is to make it more streamlined. Uh, so I have I have uh, you know received messages from from folks that the uh, submitting a paper to Psych Science is is like uh, crossing into the United States. Uh, it's just a lot of questions and a lot of sort of you know. People sometimes have the feeling that they're being policed and, and so forth. So uh, and if I could do it again, I think I could, uh, I would make some revisions to lighten the load on, on authors and uh, uh, to, you know, make it, make it more streamlined. And likewise with the, uh, with the editors, I think that it's, it is a uh, added burden and, you know, how much of a burden it is 
depends on the particulars of the, of, of the studies of the particular manuscripts and also of, uh, you know, some of them I think don't, hasn't taken very much extra time because they do a not very good job. Uh, but, uh, others do a really, really good job, so they are putting in, in more, more time. Um, there, it's a little bit hard to have a little bit of dialogue about this, but they, um, I just want to go one back and just make sure that one point was clear that you, you did show those kind of two different um, sets of questions that authors were responding to, one that had been integrated into Manuscript Central and then um, one that the badge disclosure form. Right. Um, are the ones that had been integrated into Manuscript Central, um, do, do the answers to those get used in the um, disclosure statement or, or, or find their way into the template or into the manuscript way or what's? I don't think so, David. I could be wrong, um, but I, I don't think so. I think uh, when I put those in, uh, they were, uh, you know, intended to sort of signal to authors that I want them to be doing these things. Yeah. Uh, so right. that was their, in the, the primary intent was to, uh, to tell authors at the time of submission when their motivation to, uh, to meet criteria is very high, uh, that, that we're valuing these, these, uh, things so and and uh, you can you can tell when people start uh, the submission process it assigns a manuscript number to them and uh, then you know sometime later they submit the uh, article or the the submission rather they hit the submission button and uh, you know not infrequently you'll see numbers that that you were seeing like three weeks ago or even two months ago a lot of, but where somebody had started a submission and then has taken quite a bit of time. And I suspect at least in some of those cases is because they've gone, oh gosh, if we're gonna share these data, we're gonna have to really uh, create a, uh, a much clearer, uh, more up-to-date, uh, transparent version of our data files. Or if we're gonna share our materials, we're gonna have to do some work yeah. and then those things uh, take, take time. I don't have any, measures on that, but I'm, I'm, I speculate that that does happen. Uh, second to last question, there, there could be a whole webinar on this great question. There's been a lot of talk about um, free registration for the past five years or 10 years or more. Um, what's the strongest, <laughs> best argument you have for and against free registration? Um, and I guess other open science practices generally. So I guess- uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so that's a very, very big uh, uh, question that would be hard to answer in, in, in an entire uh, webinar. I think that, that doing a pre-registration is just good practice. It's like keeping records. It's a way of, of, of um, making a note to yourself for the future about what you had in mind before you, you saw the data. So I think it's just a good and helpful uh, practice by itself. You know, I think a good critique of it is that pre-registering does not make work good. You can pre-register stupid research ideas just as easily or more easily, in fact, than you can uh, pre-register brilliant ones. So uh, it's by no means a, 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 a cure-all. I just think for people, especially if, if the nature of the work you're doing is hypothesis testing research, uh, where you're planning to use inferential statistics to make generalizations from a sample to a population. I think having uh, documentation about what your a priori uh, plans were for analyzing the data is very helpful. Yeah, I would definitely second that for specifically for hypothesis testing research. It's, uh, I would almost go to this step saying it's close to critical for hypothesis yeah. testing research. Not all research is or should be hypothesis yeah. testing work. And when it's not, you know, the, the fallback importance is just clear documented workflows. Right. Um, but um, uh, but I, I, I suspect a lot of the heated debate around it is um, uh, discussion about how much research is hypothesis testing, how much should be, how much is presented as if yeah. it were hypothesis testing. 
whys, are there incentives yeah. to yeah. present work as hypothesis testing? Um, and again, I, I think that will be the uh, topic of a many future discussions. Yeah. Um, very last question, because we're at time, but a good question, or just maybe a point, um, Ian says that the metadata you're collecting from those um, questions upon submission um, uh, could be very useful for meta research groups, you know, um, or to help authors yeah. construct data availability statements. Um, yeah, I've often, I've often thought that myself. It would be just fascinating, especially that, that sample size planning question would be, you know, it's just a, a gold mine of, of, uh, of uh, information about people's understanding of this and how it's changed over time and how it might differ in different areas of psychology and, and so forth. So uh, if anybody wants to get in there, I would certainly be supportive. I'm not sure exactly of how the ethical uh, uh, issues would be uh, handled, but, but I, I think they probably are handleable. All right, um, we're one minute over. So Steve, I just wanna say thank you very much um, for participating, for all the attendees. Thank you for attending. Uh, we'll send out um, emails with a, a link to the recording um, and, and hopefully within, within a week or hopefully not too much longer after that, we'll have a sort of a transcript or a summary for the, the written record because we want these lessons learned to be widely disseminated. So thank you, Steve, Great. thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I hope it was useful. Ciao.